Chapter 5 Shall I Kill Them Both? On his late fall trip to Bannock, with their big load of potatoes, Elliot and his partner, William Buell, took great care to avoid any encounter with Plummer and his gang of cutthroats. They worked hard all day, disposing of their potatoes and collecting money due them from the town's merchants. Near sundown, they finished. I think we'd better not stay in Bannock tonight, Elliot said. I know where there's an old abandoned cabin a few miles out of town. We can spend the night there and slip away early in the morning. That way we'll avoid any trouble. Buell agreed, and they drove their light wagon out in the direction of the cabin. There's a light. Elliot tightened the reins. Wonder who can be staying there. The two men decided to knock and find out if they might shelter there for the night. When Elliot saw the man who came to the door and looked beyond him into the lighted room, he realized that they had walked into a gathering of road agents, members of Plummer's band of outlaws. He recognized several of them. Elliot thought fast. He and Buell could not turn back to Bannock. To go on would be certain death, for he knew the man at the door had recognized him. These men had a score to settle for their leader. Elliot knew that he must deal wisely with the deadly situation, or both he and Buell would die. We planned to camp here tonight, he explained in a calm voice. We didn't know the cabin was already, would already be full. Come right in. Plenty of room for all of us. Put up your horses and come in. The man flung the door wide. Buell took bedding from the wagon and followed the man into the cabin. Elliot unhitched the team, fed them, watered them, and bedded them down. Then he turned toward the cabin with a sick feeling at the pit of his stomach. The peril of this situation almost overwhelmed him. Only cool thinking would give him and his partner any chance at all. This episode might well write the conclusion to the feud between Buck Stenson and Elliot Rouse. Buell had taken a room not occupied by the road agents and had thrown down their bedrolls. He had everything ready when Elliot came in. They blew out their lantern and Elliot got into bed. Come on to bed, Buell. He said, the law of the road agents is that you must not kill a man while he is a guest under your roof. Don't you know that? Buell said he did not feel at all sleepy. He took a position behind the rough wooden door and watched the men through the cracks. In each hand, he held a loaded gun. He put the bag of money they had gathered that day in Bannock under his knees. The men in the other room sat up most of the night playing cards. Once Buell heard part of the, their conversation, then he knew that he had been right not to trust any robber's rules of courtesy. They might never leave this place alive. One of the card players said, Shall I kill them both or just the one? Buell strained his ears to hear the reply but Rosh's laughter drowned out further talk. He kept his guns cocked and ready and saw the man who had asked the question leave the room. What sort of murder weapon had he gone to fetch? Now only a short time remained before morning. Elliot and Buell rose early dressed and went out. They found that two chickens had been prepared for breakfast. And Buell realized what victims the men had planned to murder in the night. When the partners had hitched their team to the wagon and prepared to continue their journey, one of the plumber gang, whom the others called Red, asked if he could ride along with them. I've got business down at the ranch. Elliot understood him to mean Plumber's Ranch, which the people of Bannock called Robber's Roost. He had expected some such maneuver. He realized that 
the battle of wits had begun. His life and Buell's depended on the winner. With studied coolness, Elliot said, Of course, come right along. He drove the team while Buell kept his eye on their passenger. As soon as they got out of sight of the other road agents, Buell slipped his hand down over his gun. If any road agents try to pick a fight with us, there'll be one or two fewer of them. Red turned and looked at the gun in Buell's hand. He seemed to catch the meaning of what he saw. The road had been muddied the day before, but had frozen during the night, and the wagon bumped over the trail at a slow, crawling pace. Elliot heard voices. Just as he had expected, three or four horsemen came into view. His hand went to his gun. Plumber's gang for sure. His apprehension mixed with determination as he saw them spur their horses forward. Then he recognized their leader, John Bozeman. Elliot's caution exceeded his relief, although he had never in all his life been so glad to see any person. He drew Bozeman aside and explained the desperate situation and how they had spent the night in the cabin with Plummer's cutthroats. Even while they talked, three of Plummer's men rode into view. They had evidently been following the wagon and waiting for a signal from Red. Hey, fellas, Red called to his friends. What about a ride over to the ranch? He leaped out of the wagon and mounted behind one of the other riders, and they all galloped away. As soon as the sound of hoofbeats had faded in the distance, Elliot, Buell, Bozeman, and his companions held a conference. They tried to devise some plan to foil the road agents, for all of them knew that the robbers had not abandoned their plans. Buell scratched his head. What if you fellas ride along with us back to Virginia City? Then we can leave the wagon there and ride our own horses over the home trail. Everyone agreed on this plan. The two partners reached Three Forks safely and told the story to Lucia. Plummer is getting bolder all the time. Bannock is being strangled by his band of murdering thieves. Lucia proposed to undertake another freight trip to Salt Lake City. He had got a taste of freighting. He enjoyed selecting likely merchandise and selling it to eager buyers in the gold camps. He joined a caravan bound for the Mormon city on the southern desert. On this trip, some of the bullwhackers aroused the ire of several peaceable travelers. Resentment of ill treatment flared into vengeance, and half the drivers were killed by friends of the wronged men. Lisha, as usual, had maintained a tight-lipped silence, so he escaped the massacre. Shaken and saddened, he loaded his wagon and returned to the gold towns. He meditated all the way on the fate of his fellow drivers. Again, an eternity in hell hardly seemed a suitable punishment for those rough, thoughtless young bullwhackers who had already suffered violent deaths. He tried to shut the question from his mind. He felt sure there must be a God. Everywhere he looked, the wonders of nature insisted on a higher divine power. But what kind of God could he be? He must be more cruel and fierce than any man who had ever lived. Lisha pulled his freight into Bannock, turned his oxen out to graze, and collected his horse from the livery stable. That night he slept in a hotel. In the morning he took his horse from the stable and rode out to find his oxen. The acquaintance hailed him. The vigilantes have hung Henry Plummer, the man said. They got Buck Stinson and Ned Ray, too. Vigilantes, Licious, startled, slid down 
from his horse. What do you mean by vigilantes? And Plummer executed? His mind reeled. When he had left Bannock late the year before, Plummer had been secure in his office as sheriff. Man, he grabbed the front of his friend's coat. When did this happen? It started with George Ives. The man seemed bursting with excitement. A few days ago, he murdered young Tibalt, that 16-year-old kid that worked for some of the miners. Lisha had seen young Tibalt, but Ives he knew well. George Ives, a tall, blue-eyed boy with fair hair, handsome as a prince, and he'd come from a fine family back in Wisconsin. He remembered the magnificent horse Ives used to ride into town to visit the saloons. Sometimes he backed his mount through the glass store windows and rode away laughing. Yes, Ives had gone the way of the saloon and the road agents. Well, they tried Ives at a people's court in Virginia City with a jury of 24 miners. The judge sat in a wagon, and the jury sat in a half circle by a big log fire. It was mighty cold, you see. The trial lasted over two days, and hundreds of men came. All the decent citizens demanded that Ives be executed, and all the thugs and gunmen told what terrible things they'd do if anyone harmed a hair on George Ives' head. They all had guns and flourished them around. The man paused for a breath and then went on. Last night they had the scaffold all ready, and Ives on the box with a rope around his head, around his neck. Hundreds of people cried out in protest. The Nelson Story stepped forward, a brave man, that Nelson Story. He called out in a mighty voice, Men, do your duty. Then the click of a hundred gun locks was heard as the guards leveled their weapons on the crowd and someone kicked the box from under Ives' feet. The man went on to tell how just before Ives was hanged, he had made a complete confession. He had named Henry Plummer and 30 members of his organized gang of road agents. The men of the gold camps did not wait till morning, but organized immediately for action. They dragged Plummer and two other desperados from their beds and hanged them before they realized that Ives had informed on them. Lisha got back on his horse and rode out to the draw where the execution had taken place. Sure enough, there in the early January dawn, the three bodies dangled from a scaffold that Plummer himself had erected. Lisha sat and contemplated them for a long time. All these men and the others whom the vigilantes were pouncing on today had been young and full of selfish ambition yesterday. Now only pitiful corpses remained. Again the question thundered in Lisha's mind. Where had these men gone? Were they in hell? Would they burn forever and ever, as the preacher said? He shook his head and turned away. Even though the plumber's gang had killed over a hundred people and committed many robberies, Lisha could hardly see the everlasting hellfire, see that everlasting hellfire could be a suitable punishment. The vigilantes acted with incredible swiftness. The respectable citizens of the gold camp camps had endured as much as they could bear. Patience had been exhausted. The vigilantes became pursuers, accusers, judges, juries, and executioners. The criminals had no defense against their vengeance. Lisha did not have much luck disposing of his freight that day. People crowded in from everywhere to look at the dead road agents and to recount their crimes. Sickened and confused, 
he decided to drive on to Virginia City. There he found that the vigilantes had executed five more outlaws. He stood in an unfinished store building and saw the body still hanging from the exposed beams. One got away, someone in the crowd said. Bill Hunter. At last, Lisha sold his load of salt rock at a good profit. He drove north to meet Elliot and Buell at Three Forks. He got there in time to assist in the capture of Bill Hunter.